Hello folks and thank you for joining me. This is the 25th reading on this Free Masonic Chant Knowledge channel. This is just a short one. It's called A Speculative Philosophy as unfolded in a search for a fourth dimension. By T.O. Todd, the past Grandmaster at Durham. The purport of the lecture was to show that matter does not possess a fourth dimension, that it is, like time and space, a mode of consciousness, and that if there be a fourth dimension, it must be found in the self-expression of consciousness. Man is essentially and intuitively a searcher after truth. This quest contains all the elements of a noble life and provides for all expressions of the beautiful. Its attainment belongs to no class exclusively, whether such class be a philosopher, scientist, or a religious cult. Each of these special fields yield their own results, but disclose no royal pathway to the absolute. Each searcher in the depth of his consciousness might visionize the necessary qualification for an absolute, but only to find that his thinking processes demanded release from the captivity of a deadlock finality in which he soon finds himself. Hence, the absolute is undefinable and unconditional. Neither science nor philosophy affords any measure for duration, any standard of quality, or any central position in space for universal computation. Everything considered or worked upon is merely a substitute for the time being, and not regarded as the limit of man's attainments, nor as the circum circumference of the circle of his mental and physical possibilities. Having no standard of reference, all man's search for truth is based on speculative ideas. Known facts lead him to the speculative field with the result that he speculates on new premises and then seeks for evidences to support his conclusions. When these evidences fail him, he finds other avenues open to his mind, but finds that it is even essential that he work from that which he thinks he knows to be real towards that which he speculates upon as a possibility. To dive at once into the subject under consideration, let it be postulated that the only reality which man can freely and satisfactorily venture upon is the existence of matter, which, being tangible to his present sense condition, he can make subservient to his desires. This tangibility is expressed in terms of three dimensions, length, breadth, and thickness, all of which terms are merely relatively relative and interchangeable until a standard of approach is recognized. The presence of these three dimensions gives stability, hence substance. Matter contains no intricate problems that neither science nor philosophy has been able to solve them. Even today the question, what is matter, remains unanswered. The nearest answer is that which claims it to be a substance as differentiated from a mental idea, and therefore a something which appeals to the mind as possessing three dimensions. There are so many unsolved problems of matter that the question arises as to whether it is not possible to discover a fourth dimension, which when discovered would aid considerably in solving the mysteries of existence. Hence the demand for speculating from the known three dimensions to the unknown fourth dimension. There are so many phenomena finding expression in matter in which the known laws of the three dimensions do not seem to play a part, and other phenomena which apparently set at naught are restriction of three dimensions, that there is a valid excuse and even a progressive necessity for taking up this idea seriously. But it is absolutely necessary to have some idea of the possible nature of a new measurement or its direction to enable a search to be made in a reasonable matter. manner. This can only be done by first dealing with the problem of one dimension, followed by a consideration of the second and succeeded by the third. If this could be done satisfactorily, we might perhaps discover the law of dimensional progression. The use of these words suggests that in referring to an unknown law or an unrealized dimension, it will be necessary to use words expressive of new ideas 
or give elasticity to the meaning of old ones. In the present instance, it is difficult at times to discover the best word, and if that law be discovered, the step from the mental appreciation of a third dimension to a, the mental comprehension of a fourth dimension would be considerably simplified. Let it be remembered, therefore, at the outset, that as we do not know of one-dimensional matter, or one-dimensioned matter, nor of two-dimensional matter, there is no just reason for assuming that matter may possess a fourth dimension. For the objectivity of material existence is amply provided for in the combination of three dimensions. In one expression, the material object, nor is it possible to remove one of the dimensions. Hence, it may be assumed that it is not possible to add one, a fourth. A very simple experiment of demonstrating the absence of a fourth dimension can be tried with a cube. To assist the eye, let the cube vary in size in each of the three directions, say 1 times 2 times 3 inches. Each single movement of the cube will give the following changes of dimension. Length, breadth, height. If a single movement of the cube makes the three dimensions interchangeable, another single movement should bring the fourth dimension into operation, but it does not appear to do so. The deduction is that matter does not possess a fourth dimension, and moreover that inasmuch as the three dimensions of the cube altered with each movement, the terms length, breadth, and height do not belong to the material object but are simply modes of consciousness. Many thinkers and experimenters speculate on the possibility of a fourth dimension being discoverable inside the material object, and have written books based upon that assumption. Such a search must be of ne or must of necessity be fruitless, for a cube can be penetrated only in the direction of one or more of the three dimensions of matter. If there is a fourth dimension, it must be additional and not proportional. It must carry the mind away from each and all of the three dimensions, as it will be demonstrated later. This clearly shows that if a fourth dimension exists, it must be something superior to matter, both in mere existence and in quality of expression, and that the search must be made in some other direction. Hence the necessity for breaking up the problem and endeavoring to discover the workable reality of one dimension only, following this by a workable two-dimension conclusiveness, placing matter in its position as the third-dimensional condition and if possible deduce a progressive interf interf interference as to the nature of a fourth dimension a progressive interface I would think, inter interference as to the nature of the fourth dimension Ge oh, okay geometrically regarded sorry I lost myself for a second regarded the quest must be begin at a point developed by the means of a line plane and solid in this way, there are three directions or dimensions evolved. A point is defined as having position, but no attribute, and is therefore non-material, and in terms of matter is not real nothingness. And it is from this nothingness that the finite mind must begin its task of perception. To enable the eye to be guided, let the reader draw a straight line between two imaginary points. This is a finite line but it contains an infinite number of points. Hence, we have infinitely symbolized the finite. No matter how long that line be produced from either or both ends, its quality remains unchanged. It is simply a line possessing length, which is infinite in quality as compared with the points of which it is composed, or of which it is an extension. There can be no progress made in continuing the same line. It is therefore imperative that a new direction be found, and that can only be done by every point in the line making a new departure, or taking a direction away from the line, and each point taking a similar direction, that is, at a right angle to the line. The result is a square or plane surface. This surface gives length and breadth in combination, and is indissoluble. 
and for they cannot be divorced. Inasmuch as a line does not possess breadth, the square, which does possess breadth, represents an infinite number of lines, each line possessing an infinite number of points. Consequently, the finite plane mentally symbolizes infinity multiplied by infinity. The character of the plane does not improve, and there can be no progress inferred from any extension of the plane as such. If progress towards a new dimension be desired, it must be sought for in a new direction, apart from the previously traveled directions which form the line and the plane. This can only be accomplished by every point and every line which go to the form the plane traveling in a new direction. This gives the cube, or what we know as matter, or solidity, a plane possessing no height, and a cube being such, because it does not possess height, the relationship between the two is again infinite. That is, the finite dimension cube contains an infinite number of planes, each plane representing an infinite number of lines, and each line an infinite number of points. Hence, in solid matter, there is the symbol of infinity multiplied by infinity and again multiplied by infinity. The result of this reasoning is that the mind must get into deeper touch with the idea of the infinite and a fourth dimension is discoverable. Looking at the three sketches made in the following, the foregoing argument, in following the foregoing argument, sorry, it will be seen that a line is erected upon a point. A plane is erected upon a line, and a cube is erected upon a plane, and the conclusion must of necessity follow that a fourth dimension must be erected upon a material form of some kind, and that matter must form only one aspect of the newly discovered, or to be discovered, extensional existence or greater reality. The crux of the problem rests upon now upon the parts which each of the dimensions play in forming the great reality of existence, for the part that they serve to bring the thinker to a comprehension of what are the great realities which he must make use of in order to secure a fuller development of his own consciousness, and bring himself to that state of perfection of which he innately considers himself capable, <laughs> for lack of which he likens himself himself to one stumbling along in the dark, and merely trusting to a providence which he hopes will bring good out of all things. <clears throat> okay, and there's your contradiction in this story for the believer, okay, because the believer has faith. He doesn't consider himself capable of perfection. He considers himself faithful to the Lord for his direction and merely trusting to a providence. Well, that is what faith is. You're trusting to the Lord God in the hopes that he will bring good into your life. And this here is goes along with the Freemasonic notion of apotheosis, in which they believe that through their rituals and re defining and, and re de redefining of their character and consciousness that they can achieve godhood basically okay so with that pointed out i'll continue on the one dimensioned restriction of the mind is time each of the remarks regarding a line supra can be interpreted in terms of time time discloses to the mind the idea of the infinite it cannot reach out to the end of time in either direction and every stretch of the mind leaves it where it was every point of time is as much as the in much the infinite as any other past or future Consequently, the infinite is ours now. So long as the human mind is restricted by its present conception of time, it will never solve the problem of the infinite. Whatever it may ultimately do is beyond present predic predication. There is no standard of time. Even in the corner of the universe as we know it, we are using a substituted secret in place of the true knowledge. Our year is 365 days. Mercury's year is equal to but three of our months. Neptune's year is equal to taken from 104 of our years. Certainly, there's are all one standard, the sun. But we cannot sensibly claim that the sun is the universal standard throughout the whole of creation. The second dimensional restriction is space.
and in dealing with the wonders of space the two-dimensional method is sufficient as time can be computed only from given data so space can be computed only from given data a baseline on the earth of given length will enable the astronomer to find an angle at each end of the line and by this means calculate the position in space of any of the heavenly objects that position is relative to the point from which the observation is taken the distance implies only a straight line moreover the position as a second dimensional restriction can only be decided upon by the first observing the first restriction time and the observation at each end of the line must be made with due regard to the exfluxation, the exfluxation of time. So great are the distances of these heavenly objects that the infinitude is postulated by the astronomer, for he cannot get a baseline long enough to enable an angle to be produced for some of the objects which come within the scope of his aided vision. The longest line available, that is, is that formed by the journey of the Earth around that of which defines the position of the Earth as intervals of six months, say over 180 millions of miles. And with this baseline, it is impossible to get an angle for computation. The extent to which computations may be made is stated to be such that if an inch space be divided into a hundred parallel lines, the angle for each line could be recorded at the distance of a mile. The astronomer cannot take us beyond existence of space. Possession on the Earth itself is also defined by means of two-dimensional restriction, latitude and longitude and that second dimensional method cannot be exercised until the first dimensional restriction of time has been recorded and compared with time recorded at the meridian not only is man in the infinite now but he is in the infinite here the third dimensional restriction is physical matter or the material body which carries the attributes of three dimensions in its most perfect and most wonderful form there is no absolute standard of measurement for matter. Nations differ in their standards. Each standard is a substituted secret until the genuine is discovered. It is not necessary to provide arguments for claiming the immutability of or immutability and indestructibility of matter. In some form or another, it fills all space so far as investigation can take the mind. We are told that there is no vacuum but as many have agreed that time and space are only different modes of consciousness it will be quite safe to follow the philosopher who rules matter out of our so-called so reality and makes it only another mode of consciousness at all events each mode of consciousness brings us face to face with the infinite and the totally inscrutable if then our consciousness is built up out of these modes it is not is it not safe for the time being to assume no it's never safe to assume but anyway as a philosophy that consciousness is the fourth dimension that each human being exercising the attribute of progressive consciousness has reached that stage in evolution where he becomes a unit in the infinite consciousness oh boy the possibilities opened up by this thought are certainly infinite and constitute a most valid reason for searching for the fourth dimensions of consciousness. Oh, now consciousness has fourth dimensions. Okay. For the fourth dimensions of the fourth dimensions of consciousness. As time can be measured only by reference to time itself, space measured only by relation to space, and matter only in terms of matter, so consciousness can be measured only in terms of consciousness. The greatest attribute of consciousness is that of love. This must be the standard for measuring the individual in relation to himself as the first consideration, to others as the second, and to truth as the third, and to God as the fourth, according to the author. When man understands his right relationship to each of these four qualities of his consciousness, he will have discovered the fourth dimension, and he must work simultaneously in time, now, and space, here, and in matter, his body, and thus prepare himself from his own center. When he attempts to reach the circumference, he cannot materially err, and he may come into possession of the lost secrets, which <laughs> much sooner than he anticipated. All right, the foregoing is but a brief report of the lecture. 
There are many references to the ritual and symbolism of Freemasonry, of course, which are omitted. This is extracted from the transactions of the Author's Lodge, number 3456 in EC, volume 1, in 1915. Um, so that would make up for certain scientific discrepancies in the philosophy, uh, but the rest of it is is overly apparent and uh, thus a, pr a perfect reading for this channel and to stress the point that this channel was created for. And uh, with that, I thank you for joining me and we'll see you next time.